Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. Welcome to the Henry Huzzy Coaching YouTube channel and podcast, where we discuss everything physique and lifestyle related, as well as the science of getting jacked. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next session of Chat with Coach. Super, super honored today to have uh, Cliff Wilson on, Cliff Wilson of uh, Team Wilson Bodybuilding. Uh, a little bit of introduction on Cliff. He is an IPA and NGA professional bodybuilder, one of the top physique coaches definitely in the industry. He's a public speaker and author, a first form uh, sponsored athlete. As well, uh, just to speak of his accolades, as of current, I don't know if these numbers are a little outdated, he has under his belt for his athletes 140 overall wins, 85 pro cards, 43 pro titles, and six natural world champions. Did you add any to that since? Uh, yeah, I have, not, I have not added them up for this year at all. So that, no? But but that that's that's more a more than uh, generous in, uh, introduction. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my <laughs> absolute pleasure. No, well, the accolades speak to yourself. And you know, uh, for those people out there who don't know who Cliff is, um, Cliff, I'd like to talk. How did you get into prep coaching when you originally started? Uh, yeah, you know, it was it was a little different for me because uh, I kind of started before. I guess I would say social media really came became the big thing in the fitness industry. Um, when I first started coaching, it was around 2010, 2000, late 2009, and Facebook was becoming very, very popular at that point, but it wasn't everything. And so, uh, you know, I didn't start off with the goal of coaching and, you know, really kicking ass in the coaching market. I was just kind of doing it locally and just doing it because I loved it. And, uh, you know, I had done my first show. I did well. Um, and a couple of guys at my gym wanted to do their first shows, and so they asked me if I could help them. And I, I didn't even know if I knew enough to coach at that point, um, but I just knew that I knew more than them. <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> and, and so um, I was like, sure, you know, I'll help you. Um, now, I will say for those that haven't followed me, um, my, my own genetics for the sport of bodybuilding are not great. Uh, I'm actually just a really, really thin guy. So in my own personal bodybuilding career, I had always um, searched for better ways of doing things, meaning um, I, never, I didn't really listen to what the biggest guy was always telling me because I had found out early on that just didn't work for me. Yeah. So um, in my own career, I had really gone the more scientific route. Um, I, I was self-educated, but I would buy um, subscriptions to you know, scientific journals. Uh, I would read studies, and I would figure out a way to apply it practically in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did with them. And, uh, you know, they both did really well. And just as they won their shows and then I had a few more people ask and then they would win or do well and I'd have more people ask. And um, before I know it, within like a year and a half, I was full-time bodybuilding coaching. I wasn't <laughs> even, uh, yeah, I was, I, I had quit my job and um, I've been doing that ever since, uh, since about 2012, so about five years now. Full-time bodybuilding coach, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty phenomenal that you just started completely at like a pure grassroots level. Like you just did it, and then you just like learned about it, and it was just like, it took right off that way. Yeah, which is... yeah and, and funny story, I didn't even have a Facebook page back then, let yeah. alone an Instagram or anything like that. I didn't even have a Facebook page and uh, or a website, and my, my wife was like, you need to get a Facebook page and I was like ah, I don't even need that that doesn't matter um, the only thing I did was like I would put uh, I would just give people t-shirts that I coached and yeah. it would just have my it would just have my email on the back of the t-shirt and I would just pick I just picked, I just kept picking up clients that way I just kind of figured if I have the best guy in a show people will want to know what that guy's doing and 100 percent that's, just kinda, that's yeah. just kind of how it went yeah, that's pretty awesome though, but you know, that is really good for, especially when you're starting off, you know, that word of mouth of, you know, especially if people are winning, people are going to want to know, like you said, how did that guy do that? And like, you know, it's pretty amazing. Now, um, we'll start about, talk about where to start when you come into prep, because, you know, it's very uh, important when you're starting a prep to basically set yourself up for success. In fact, uh, when I was going through the application process and I was talking back and forth with Daniel, um, 
I was, remember, I finished last year, I was doing my men's physique, and I was like 183 pounds on stage. And uh, when I was finishing the application process, and they were like, yeah, sure, um, we will take you on next year, definitely. But you need to be 178 pounds at the beginning of your 16-week prep. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, w w what? And it didn't really click with me until I did, I, I thought about it for a while. And I said, you're like, you know, this, I need to basically set myself up to have an advantageous position at the start. I can't start with, you know, 50, 30, 40 pounds to lose and expect to be peeled and ready, especially, you know, three or four weeks out. And, you know, you kind of want to do that. So when you're talking with people, like, where do you ask them to be in an advantageous position to start, like for weight loss terms, uh, you know, planning, especially if you haven't worked with this person before? I guess I would say there's um, a couple there's a couple things I look at. Some are more uh, hard data, hard facts, mm -hmm. and then there's a secondary thing that I look for in terms of overall mental and physical positioning. Um, I'll get to both of those. So first off, hard data that I look for is, uh, and you talk to my assistant Dan Feeney, who mm -hmm. he's my assistant, but he's also a coach himself. So yes. it's one of the reasons that he helps me part time to organize all my applications because I can't. You know, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have time to do that all anymore. But he he understands the process, so I have him kind of do it for me. Now, um, it becomes a matter of hard numbers. So when I look at somebody's pictures for where they were at their last show, um, usually people need to be leaner than they were at their last show. I would yes. say very few competitors just step on stage 100% lights out and as lean as they need to be. Um, so based on those pictures, I look at, okay, how many – more pounds do they need to lose to be at their absolute best? Uh, and a lot of people think, oh, maybe two or three pounds, but a lot of times it's more like 10 to 15 pounds that people needed to lose. And so, you know, I do that math, and then I think, how many pounds per week will they need to lose to get there? And then I just kind of sort of estimate total number of weeks. Or if they have a certain number of weeks that they want to work with me for, I need to estimate how many pounds can we lose in those number of weeks, and then I'll give them a starting spot. So uh, you are right for like a 16 week prep, usually I'm only gonna, I'm gonna want somebody to be within maybe 14 to 16 pounds of their contest weight, which, mm -hmm. is, pretty, which is pretty damn lean. Uh, yes. That, yeah, I mean that's, that's to the point where you're walking around and people stop and they're like, holy shit, this guy's lean. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so, you know, um, just to give as an example, uh, last year in my own contest prep, I had lost, uh, I want to say, 36 pounds over the course of my prep, which, you know, that's a good amount, but it's not. I wasn't fat or anything like that to start my prep, but I took about 48 weeks to lose those 36 pounds. Um, it's quite now, so <laughs> Yeah, so people will ask, why do you go so slow? Um, I'll say, uh, because for a natural competitor, the slower you go, the more muscle mass you're going to preserve. Um and so that's very important because you, you know, this is what it's about. It's a bodybuilding contest. Uh, you need every ounce of muscle that you can. And there's also a certain look to somebody that's lost weight more slowly. Um, the, the skin doesn't sit quite as loosely. Now, I don't know the exact mechanisms for some mm. of these, but the skin just looks a little tighter around, around the muscle tissue. It just looks better. Uh, people look a little fuller as long as they didn't, you know, die for too drastically. Yeah. Um, but uh, the slower you go, the better you're going to look at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that may sound extreme, but really it's a very subtle process of losing that fat. Um, now, so from those hard numbers, you know, you can do the math of I need to lose maybe a pound per week. Um, but even for some people with slower metabolic rates, sometimes even a pound can be difficult to maintain over the course of a 16-week prep. Uh, especially for some smaller females, you know, if you if you've ever tried to prep a 110 pound female, sometimes losing a pound per week is not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, 100 <laughs> um, percent. Yeah, especially at the tail end, for sure. Yeah. So then the other thing I look for um, besides that is uh, the mental and physical state of the person. Um, one thing I always say is I never want to start prep with somebody that is already struggling to maintain whatever plan they are currently on. Uh, if you can't go more than a few days without cheating on your diet, then that's going to be a problem because 
if you're in your off season and you're supposed to have plenty of food coming in, you can't stop cheating on your diet. It's only going to get worse once you get in prep because things are going to get harder. If you're going to be more tired, you're going to be, you know, just a lot more emotion swirling as the show day starts to come around. So that's going to, a lot of people sort of use prep as a motivational band aid. you know, oh, yeah. I'm having trouble sticking to my plan. Let me go into prep so that way I can feel motivated again. Um, but if you ask me if that's the case, if you can't keep it together in the off season and you need that motivational band aid of prep, mm -hmm. then there's some sort of underlying motivational issue that you're having trouble with. So I will usually want to see those get corrected before somebody dives into a prep. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, uh, and you know, a lot of that stuff uh, has to do. I've been reading a lot of recently about cortisol and like the effects on like the physique and like all that stuff. And as you were saying just then, you know, um, a longer style diet can often be better. And you know, if you're stressed out and you have to cut your calories super high, you know, a lot of that effects could happen. Whereas the stressful levels could maintain throughout. You reduce your stress levels and your cortisol levels to a little bit less. Maybe that could be adding to water retention and stuff like that, especially you know, between your skin. But besides that, you know, uh, with starting prep, you know, as you said, it was kind of crazy when I you said to me 178. I was a little bit heavier than that this year, but last year when I was on stage, as I mentioned, I was uh, I was 183. I was much much more muscular this year, and I'm down to 170, just under 172. So I'm like. <laughs> I was I was way off, way way off. <laughs> it, it, I'll tell you, it always hurts the ego to hear that because uh, I've been there before too. I know yeah. how it goes. I'm I'm six foot one, and even like my my off season, like right now, I I hover around you know between 190 and 195 pounds, and people are like, oh man, what do you compete at like 180? I'm like, oh. 165, 166. <laughs> right? They're like, yeah. they're like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even for me now, I'm at a position that, you know, I've got about four or five left to go, a good solid four or five. And, yeah. you know, I've, I'm at the position I have like veins throughout my stomach is up, but I genetically, I was talking to Dan about this earlier, actually, that I genetically hold uh, all my weight in my back. That's where it all sticks to, right? So you could look at a picture of me four weeks ago and people would be like, wow, you're like, one week out, like, no problem. But I'm like, yeah, but I'm not giving you the back shot. But it is. <laughs> it does hurt the ego a little bit. But the way I look at it for myself is um, there's an end result that exists. And ego or not, I have to get from point A to point B. And, you know, I might think that this is where I want to be. But I know in myself that I this is where I have to be, like, at that point. So if I have to lose an extra, you know, 15, 20 pounds from last year, and that is exactly what you have to do to become successful, you know? Yes. And, and you know, I think there's a couple of things that uh, the average competitor needs to distinguish. Uh, first off, what looks best in the gym on your physique is not what looks best on stage. No. Uh, the stage highlights everything. Uh, whereas in the gym, once you are pretty much lean in your shoulders and arms and, you know, your chest, you look really, really good. But that doesn't show where your hamstrings and your lower back and, you know, like you said, maybe your your back, upper back for some people yeah. or your quads. It doesn't highlight what those look like, those things that don't show in the gym. So generally when people start telling you look good in the gym, a lot of people think, oh, I'm almost there. But usually, usually you need to get to the point where, okay, you get lean and people start telling you you look good, you look good, you look good. But then you need to keep going where people start going, what are you doing? What are you doing? You look so, you, you look so skinny. Yeah. Um, because that will look better on stage. And then the other thing I think people need to distinguish is do you want to be an average competitor up there? Do you know what I mean? Um, I, guess, I guess you need to ask yourself where your standards lie because um, I think a lot of people, they come in with this perception of once my abs are in, I'm ready to step on stage. And yes, you are ready to step on stage and look like you belong, but do you look like you belong or do you want to excel? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times, one thing I, I ask uh, a lot of my clients sometimes is like, do you want to, do you just want to have fun or do you want to be as good as you can be? Because yeah. sometimes those don't go directly hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's a question I think each person needs to ask themselves when they're yeah. really grinding out those last few pounds. I, I had a really good conversation with... Um a uh, figure competitor recently, we had a little training session the weekend and she said, you know, there's a, a big difference between uh, competitors and people that do shows. 
there are a lot of people that do shows and like you said they do it to, almost for fun but you know there's those other people that are they do it to win you know and that that's what their driving thing is and a lot of people just do it because like you said they do it because it, they want to have fun and they have this goal and they are drove to do so but you know it's uh <laughs> like you said you yeah, gotta get to that oh, go ahead no and I, I totally agree and i think it's uh you know, it's something that I think each person needs to ask themselves because there is nothing wrong with just wanting to get up on stage, have fun, look good, do your thing. Um, but, you know, for me as a coach, for myself as a coach and the people I want to work with, and it's not even about the win. You know, wins, I guess, success and wins come. You know, they come and they go. But like, the ultimate goal is really just self-actualization, achieving <clears throat> your the best that you can with your genetic potential. And, uh, you know, I... The thing is, for myself and the people I work with, that's what we're all about. And so, you know, you, you know, I, I want to work with people that are about that, you know. And it's like, if you achieve the best you possibly can, then you've won. Uh, you know, whether you get first place, fifth place, or tenth place, that doesn't matter. You got on stage with the absolute best you can. And I, I always tell people, I would rather have them be the best they possibly can, and they're on stage, and we know that. I would rather have them take third or fourth at that than to win but know that we didn't get their best. that in the back of their head they will always know that they could have been that two percent better yeah yes I, I, that, I, that, to me that first place means nothing because they didn't achieve their best you know what yeah. i mean i'd rather have them be at their best and take third or fourth or something like that and it, it's really funny that you mentioned this because i actually was talking about this just recently because i'm at a position right now i took uh two trophies in my last two years. I got third place both times, but this year's competition is actually savage in my division. And I'm really, really excited to get up there because I know right now that I'm going to be 100% ready. And even if I don't place this year, I would love to, but the fact that I know that I'm going to be able to come in with my best package possible and look the best I ever have, that's a direct improvement on my first two years that I can like, that's it. Right. And that's what the main goal is to be the best I can possibly look. And, and, and you know, if this will be, I'll say this, well, this is such a metaphor for life in general, but I guess <laughs> I would say there's a certain confidence um, that, and satisfaction that comes with knowing you did literally everything you could. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're standing on stage, even even if you don't get the placing you want, um, there's a real calm that comes about knowing you've left it all on the table. There's nothing else you could have done. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but the, there's a lot of doubt that comes with knowing that you could have done more. And so yeah. there's a you know regardless of placing, standing on stage with those two different because I've been in both situations even in my own career. Um, you know, there's a two there's two different. Things, I guess I would say going into that situation. If you know you've done absolutely everything you can and left it all on the table, it's you're ready to accept whatever whatever comes your way. One hundred percent. And I, I think that's something that is a, a lot uh, hard pill hard pill to swallow for some. But that's a really 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 good piece of advice that I could actually give anyone. So let's move into uh, the nutrition side of things. Uh, what kind of diet style do you go with with your competitors? Um, like for clean eating, if it fits your macros, do you do like a responsible if it fits your macros meal plan sort of thing? Where, where do you start off with your people? Uh, it, you know, it's it's funny that you use the word responsible because uh, that's that's the term I use all the time. Uh, I call it I call it, call it responsible. Diet. Um, I you know I give my clients macronutrient macronutrients to hit. I don't give them exact foods, mm -hmm. um, but I do give them. Uh, recommendations and guidelines for how they should eat. Um, I, I want to see them making responsible choices. Now, I'm not going to say don't ever have some ice cream because you know you can still fit ice cream into a responsible diet. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a grown adult, I shouldn't have to tell you not to get all of your 300 cars from candy every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, so. Uh, I want to see things like um, a wide variety of vegetables, fruit, um, you know, just, uh, uh, in fact, variety is the big word I'm looking for. I want to see a variety of nutritious foods. And then if you want to add in a few less than nutritious foods, then you go about it. Um, because that is actually going to be the diet that will lead to you being able to stick to it long term and also just give you a better physique. 
because even if you stick with a clean eating, I know a lot of clean eaters that eat nothing but chicken and sweet potatoes or chicken and rice every day, but that's pretty nutritionally devoid. Um, there's not a lot of vitamins and minerals in chicken and rice every day. Yeah, you need micronutrition uh, as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's not a lot of nutrition there. So, um, you know, I want to see, uh, you'd be better off going with a meal of, you know, chicken and rice and vegetables and a little bit of, or maybe a couple of cookies than you are with just chicken and rice. Even though you added those cookies, you know, you still have your vegetables in there. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's a hard concept for a lot of newer competitors to grasp because we we were oh hold on Cliff, you're all, broke up a little bit there you know what I mean just give me a second you dropped yeah. connection all right I think you're better there now what was the last thing you heard me say uh it was about 15 seconds ago I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly because uh, I, well, I was just I was just saying that um I think that uh, this concept that there needs to be balance in yeah. the diet can be hard for newer competitors to grasp. Yeah. Um, because, let's face it, we all join the sport because we're probably all or nothing people. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we are those type of people. I mean, that's what bodybuilders generally are. Uh, we, felt, uh, we felt good improving our bodies and we're like, we want to just go as far as we can with it. So with diet, people take the same approach. They want They want to know if I should eat all the carbs, or if I should eat none of the carbs? Should I, you know, yeah. eat the clean it? Should I eat entirely non-processed foods, or should I eat nothing but processed foods? You know, but there's there's a balance to it, and I think sometimes suppressing our all-or-nothing nature is going to lead us down the right path. Yeah, there is a, there is a very very big middle ground when it comes to that. I find you know, and as you mentioned, um, for uh, I know some people that if they like cheat and they do off the clean eating sort of thing, they. Uh, it causes it causes a rebound effect that they'll keep doing that, or stepping outside, and it'll it'll might cause them to have cravings and things like that. Like for me, for example, like I'm dieting right now on 325 grams of carbs, and I'm still oh. losing a lot of weight per week. No, no, just you wait. I work it so I would work out in the morning. I work all day, and then I go to my job at night, where there's 17 stairs from the first level of my job at a restaurant to the second. So I'm doing about Oh, you know, 300 floors of stairs, 500 floors of stairs a night. <laughs> so I'm burning off a lot of that with neat and a little bit of cardio at the gym. So <laughs> all those carbs are completely devoid. <laughs> but in order for me to, to stay full, I can't have any, like, it's basically everything's clean eating for me. But it's basically me managing my fullness, right? But I mean, I tell my people that I'm coaching, I'm like, listen, if you if you can fit like you know honey into your shake and you like it and it makes it taste better and you still fit in your macros and it's not affecting you to be hungry down the road, it's perfectly fine, you know. Uh, especially you know, but I say make sure you get that responsible eating in there. Like, don't just <laughs> as a quote for you from one of your competitors actually, just eat like a cocoa puffs and chicken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you heard. So you heard that story. Huh? I, I I did hear that story of the guy that got what was it like four? He last month he just ate like cocoa puffs and chicken and two, got shredded. Two months. Two months. Yeah. Two months um, of cocoa puffs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. <laughs> yeah, but I'd also like to mention that he did win that, didn't he? He won his uh, division. He did. He won his he did. division. But, yeah, he turned. Yeah, it it but, probably wasn't the best idea. No, and, and I'll say that I, I think it's one of those things that you can do short term, but then over the long term it will start to catch up to you. One hundred percent. I think it. It. I'll say this for fat loss, food choice just doesn't really matter that much. Um, but I think for muscle growth, because of nutrition, over the long term, it starts to matter. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, uh, I would think that a body that is getting all the appropriate nutrients, micronutrients, would, you know, it's for fat loss, you're still going to lose fat. But, you know, you might have that extra, like, 1% that that, like, nutrition is actually helping. There's no way that that's hindering everything, right? Your body definitely runs better when it's being properly fed micronutrients as well. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, so what do you do for your competitors for supplements? Uh, for me, myself, like I like to offer a list of like, you know, if this is what I say to do, basically like the very basics and I don't really 
say to go much outside of that besides like if you can afford it and you want to spend it this might enhance your recovery this might enhance your ability to perform in the gym and but it's all a kind of a what they're comfortable spending their money with so how, how do you tell your clients what do you tell them to do when it comes to supplements yeah you know uh one thing so for those that don't know i am sponsored by first form and uh one thing i really liked about first form when i started with them because you know, I had had other companies uh, talking to me, and but I think if anybody that's followed me for a while knows that um, I really just try to be honest with all my approaches. And a lot of supplement sponsorships and companies, they want you to push, you know what I mean? Push yeah. supplements onto people. Uh, I guess I would say create the belief that you need. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, uh, you, you You need this. And one thing I really liked about First Form is they were like, just, you know, just be honest. You know, you don't you don't have any requirement about what you um, need to say to people. Um, you just tell them the truth of what you believe. And so that was big for me. That is that is actually amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were just like, you know, you know, they they were like, just be honest, and we believe in the supplements. And then you know, you just tell people what you think they should take, and that was big for me. Because um, I, I guess I would say also not just as an athlete, but as a coach, I feel I have like a res- I have a responsibility to people to you know not take advantage of that position of authority. Does that if that makes sense? What and so that? you know with my with my clients, uh, when I'm recommending supplements, I keep I keep a hierarchy of you know what uh, what is more important and traveling down to less important. And like you said, uh, supplements are a small piece of the puzzle, but they can, but they can help. Um, and you know, so it's it becomes within a matter of, is it worth it for your budget? Because you know, somebody that's making forty thousand dollars a year will have a drastically different supplement budget than somebody that's making two hundred thousand dollars a year. Totally. Uh, and so, you know, somebody that's making two hundred thousand dollars a year could probably just buy all the supplements and you know, really really put it into their budget um, and so you know to them it's not that big a deal to get a full range of them you know but other people need to budget more accordingly so I would say with a lot of my clients I give them a list of order of importance and then um, we may talk about it too because what's most important to one person may not be most important Very different to another. somebody else yeah. um, like I do like a whey protein usually after training um, but for example, like a more time release protein, uh, for some people that have a hectic schedule and sitting down to eat a meal, that's not always feasible. So they're, they, they may need that time release protein or they're just not going to be able to end up getting all of their meals in and getting all their protein for the mm-hmm. day. But somebody like me who works at home, well, I shouldn't say that because I do have a lot of time release protein throughout my day, but somebody that maybe works at home and has a little bit more time, or maybe stay-at-home moms or dads, you know, where they just are at home all the time, it's not a big deal for them to cook a meal and have it all the time. So they don't really need that time-release protein like somebody else would. Yeah. Um, so I think that need is also an individual thing. Um, so, you know, I do create a list of things like, um, you know, with the first, you know, like, like I said, first form just gives me total freedom to just be honest, which I just got, I, as, for me, that's priceless um, because, you know, I just want to be honest with people. And so, you know, I'll list it from things like, you know, a whey protein, and then I also kind of assess like a time release protein, um, uh, fish oil, you know, for people that maybe don't eat as many healthy fats as they probably should. See, so that's another thing of individuality. If somebody's eating salmon a couple times a week, they probably don't need a fish oil, but if somebody hates fish, then you may want to add the fish oil in there. Totally. Um, creatine obviously is just a great supplement and really cost effective. Um, I, I'm a big fan of pre-workout supplements. Um, I, I'll say this. Uh, I'm going to say this about pre-workout, which I don't feel is said often enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that moderation of pre-workout supplements is important because it's become really popular to go with the most extreme pre-workout you can possibly find and one thing that I find happens is people get burned out um, you know like the, the one of the reasons I actually really like the the first form pre-workout uh, is because it's like 300 milligrams of caffeine 
It's, you know, it's not excessive with some of the other stimulants in there. It's enough to get you up, make you feel like you're, you know, ready to roll and have a good workout, but uh, you're not going to pay for it the next day with a low. And, um, you know, and I, I've tried, I think we've all tried some pre-workouts like that where you take it and you feel like you're on drugs. <laughs> you know, you, yeah, you, no, you I've, feel, I've Yeah, you feel absolutely <laughs> insane, but then you feel the next day you feel run down. Like, yeah. you know, be, you're, you're paying for it the next day. Um, so I, I would say with pre-workouts, I like people to have a little bit more steady pre-workout. And uh, I've even had some people tell me, too, with some of the really strong stimulants, men in particular, tell me they start having libido issues if they're taking a, an overly interesting powerful uh, pre-workout every day. Uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you're a male and you're in your off-season uh, and you find in your off-season you're having libido issues, uh, which should not happen, yeah. Um, so, sometimes I would say look at your stimulant intake and see if maybe see what happens when you dial that back. That's really cool. Sometimes I've never even heard that, of that, that, but that's something I'm definitely gonna look into. That's really cool. The uh, pre workout yeah, thing. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm super, super, super sensitive to pre workout. Like I, or even like stimulants in general. Like you know, if I'm dieting, if I'm taking any stimulants past like a pre workout past twelve o'clock, I will have a hard time sleeping that night. Like I, that's why I work out super early in the morning because <laughs> if I take my pre-workout, I'm safe that I know that I'm going to get a solid sleep that night. But yeah, like yeah. I'm super, super sensitive to it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and anybody who's following me on Instagram knows that I, I like my stimulant, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, um, but I'm really careful about monitoring and, you know, indiv like you said, individual tolerance is, uh, it can vary uh, grossly from one person to the next. I, I am the type of person where I can have 600, 800 milligrams in a day, and I don't have problems sleeping at night. Mm. But I'm really careful about um, – because you know if you do push it for too many days in a row, you start to feel that effect in the coming days. You just can't seem to get up like you normally do. Um, yeah. you, know, you just feel sluggish. And so I'm really, I'm really a big proponent of – just managing stimulant intake. You know, pick your high days, pick your low days. You know, save your high days for when you know you're going to need it. Um, have low days. Like that's another thing too. Is people don't like on days I don't train, I just have zero stimulants. Um, I don't, Same. I don't. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's okay to have a day where you feel a little lower. You know what I mean? Just yeah. picking on a day where you're not going to have to do a lot on that day. Yeah, no, um, I, I find that I get if I continually just nail my pre-workout, I'll just feel like you said. After a couple of days, you kind of feel fried, and it's just like you can take a scoop of your pre-workout even like at the end of like a week, and it's like it doesn't even really get to you to where you were when you took it on Monday, and it's like okay, like something's off here. Like you need a little bit of tone it down yeah. a little bit, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, and and then, and then I guess the last thing I would say with supplements is pick your brands carefully. Um, I have a lot of, uh, I'm fortunate to have a lot of uh, more inside knowledge of the industry because I know people that work at supplement companies or have worked at supplement companies. And, you know, a lot of times if you're going with these really cheap brands, um, yeah. there's, a, there's, a re there's a reason for it, you know. If you're buying that, um, you know, that brand at Walmart. I was you know, just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're... Even some of the GNC, the house brand stuff, you know, you're a lot of times you're not getting what you're actually paying for. Um, and, and I'll even say like something like in particular fish oils, a lot of times they're already rancid by the time you buy them. Yeah. Um, the Some of the herbal things, uh, the herbal products don't have enough active ingredient in it. Um, you know, and that was another thing too, even when I was looking at who I was, you know, because I, I, I've only been sponsored by First Form. Uh, for eight months, but my wife was actually sponsored with them, and when she for, before me, and when you know, even when she was looking around too, like they're producing FDA inspected facility, you know, things like that. Where because there, it is so easy for somebody to just create their own supplement company. There's no barriers to it, 100%. and they, and what they're putting in there just isn't being inspected um, until until there's a complaint. Uh, it's not being looked at, and so uh, I just think I, I would just say to people. You will be better off taking fewer supplements that you know are quality than taking more supplements that are crappy. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree completely. You know, and so I I know people that they write me and they're like, this tastes like garbage and like for protein. And you know, I've been mixing it in my blender for two minutes and it's still lumpy. And I'm like, 
all right, like, <laughs> if they're not even making it so it, like, is even remotely tastes good and it's just lumpy as hell and, like, you can't mix it with a blender, I was like, they're definitely not going, you know, are really trying to strive for a quality product. Yeah, well, I even remember a couple of years back, I can't remember the name of the company, but there was a big up-and-coming supplement company. I never tried their protein, but I just remember some of my clients were saying, oh, my gosh, you know, it has, like, 26 grams of protein per scoop. Uh, like one gram of fat, it tastes amazing, and they, you know, they weren't a huge brand yet. They were like they were building, and uh, somebody took it to a lab and tested it, and it had like only twelve grams of protein and like and like thirty five grams of sugar. <laughs> so yeah, no it, wonder it tastes amazing. That, right? that, that's exactly why it tastes amazing. It was just all sugar, and right. so uh, they basically so, gave you chocolate milk, is what they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I was having like clients, but and it was funny because a lot of my clients, I did, I put it together, you know, later on, but some of my clients, a lot of my clients that were telling, raving about this protein, just could not lose weight. Um, they, you know, <laughs> they, they just <laughs> wouldn't lose weight. A little I know there essentially taking weight gain powder. Right, uh, yeah. Two scoops so, of that and it's like, you're cooked. You're cooked. The yes, caloric yeah. density. So, 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 you know, make sure you're going with a reputable brand and, you know, it. you're probably going to have to pay more for it, but you're better off just taking fewer supplements at that point because um, yeah. a lot of times the cheap stuff just isn't worth it anyway. No, you're basically throwing your money away in that situation and the quality is much better than, you know, quality of what you're taking. Totally. Now, um, talking about nutrition as well, uh, refeeds, diet, I noticed that in the last while, re, uh, diet breaks have become very, very popular for some people that are doing very long-term preps. Um, what do you do in the term of refeeds for clients? Like, do you give them sporadic ones? Do you watch it and give it as they deserve it? Is it something that you schedule in? Um, it uh, A refeed is something that I schedule in. Um, <clears throat> Because I, I just feel like that's good practice, and it makes the week go a lot easier um, if you know if people have that in front of them. Uh, and it's it's a mental, and here's one of the things too is it, it's a mental and physical reprieve, <laughs> you know, from the diet. Um, I, I'm going to speak from my own experience, but I know other people experience this. I just know that um, after I take my refeed days. Uh, Obviously, you train a little bit better, but there's just this um, calm that comes with it. Uh, and, and now, it's it's now I think this impacts hormones over the long term. And I, I I would be curious to see if somebody did a non refeed prep um, compared to one with refeeds, um, because I, I use this term sometimes, but uh, I think you might know what I'm talking about because I'm I'm a very uh, laid back guy. Um, you know, I I, I, I I like to think of myself as pretty intense, but I'm not ever stressed. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I, I think I, anybody who's ever been through prep, there's something that I would almost refer to as like a prep anxiety. Does that make sense? You know, mm -hmm. you just have this little little anxious feeling. You know what I mean? Like at all times. And I, it's, you know, it's from the dieting process. But uh, I find that in the day of my refeed and the day after my refeed and maybe even a couple days after, there's sort of an alleviation of that anxious feeling. And yeah. it's kind of, you know, just giving your body a break. And I, I've seen, I have tested it in the past years ago, going longer periods without refeeds. And um, it appeared to me, now I don't have hard data to back it up with body composition results, but it appeared to me that people held muscle mass a little bit better um, mm. from the refeeds. And I, I don't even think it has anything really to do with performance per se. I think it just has, probably has to do with hormones, like you said, cortisol. And because they just feel better. Um, now, how many I do can kind of vary depending on what I think a person needs. Um, I have it where sometimes I'll do two refeeds per week, sometimes up to 10 to 14 days if somebody really can't lose weight um, very easily. Um, but I do like to work them in. Uh, to answer your question about, question about diet breaks, diet breaks for me really come on an as-needed basis. Um, generally, I will not insert a diet break unless I'm 100% sure we are ahead of schedule. Um, because otherwise, you know, forget about it. That makes no sense. And even in a lot of cases, sometimes I won't even um, I won't even put the diet break in there, even if we are ahead of schedule, because I would much rather actually just get down early and then bring food back up coming into the show. So totally. not, not to say I don't um, ever include, you know, a day here or there where I say let's take an extra refeed day or something like that. 
um, if I feel like the person really needs it. But for the most part, uh, I'm not going to really push the diet break unless I know we can afford it on a time scale. Yeah. Yeah. I, me personally, I did take a diet break this time because starting off with my calories and things like that, I undershot them like crazy. <laughs> and I lost weight pretty quickly coming up right out of the gate. And I was like, okay, this is going to slow down. Like this is the first week I lost <laughs> X amount of pounds. This is the second week. Okay. Then it was like week three. At this point, I wasn't doing any cardio at all. I only actually added nice. cardio in like a week and a half ago. Yeah. And like, I, it's just from the amount of need I do, and I was eating still a lot of food. I was, you know, 250 grams of carbs, like a pound per like gram of protein, like fats were at 50, and I was just basically, I, I just went, woof, right down, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay, like this is not sustainable, and it got to the point for me that my hunger was a real big issue, to the point that I was like, I need to kind of like reset for a little bit, and I took a week that was at my uh, overreaching week. I took a diet break and I basically, at the end of that week, my weight was exactly the same as it was the week before. I was still on schedule from when I started the prep. I knew where I needed to be. But at the end of that week of eating at maintenance, I felt completely refreshed and really good. But as you said, uh, the macro goal of being where I needed to be for stage was very easily yeah. obtainable if I took that one week off. And you said the word, on schedule. That is yeah. uh that is something I, I a lot of times I'll have people send me you know questions through Facebook or Instagram and they'll say you know I'm gonna be competing in like eight weeks um, I've been dieting for you know maybe they've been dieting for 15 weeks which is a long diet already and they you know they say you know should I insert a diet break and then they'll show me where they're at and I'm like hell no you don't have time for a diet break you know <laughs> keep going like, you need to cut oh. more of anything yeah yeah, yeah. yeah like you know um, don't insert a diet break at the expense of your conditioning. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's a, like your situation is the perfect situation for a diet break. Things were going too quickly. You needed to slow it down. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the opportunity presented for, um, sort of a, a break. And, you know, but if, yeah, if you don't have that time, don't, don't no. put that diet break in there. <laughs> totally not. In fact, after the diet break, I went from 250 uh, to 325 grams of carbs, and I've been steadily losing on that since as well. So I'm like still dialing it back. And people looked at me, and they're like, so wait, you, you took a break from your diet, and then you added more food in? And I'm like, well, like I just can't keep slashing away, right? You can't just keep <laughs> cutting away your food and expect like you know another 10 weeks down the road to be you know, feeling fresh as a daisy. It's a slow process that you can't just go crazy with, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it should be week by week. Yeah. So, you know, like, as I said, it's a, a macro goal with, you know, micro changes every now and then. Um, so during week to week, how much do you generally like drop calories or add in cardio or anything like that? Or actually, let's just stick to the nutrition side of things. Um, how much do you drop like your calories at a time? And do you take them from a specific area? Like if someone has a little bit higher fats, do you take it from fats first? Uh, I, I know you like to diet uh, people on a little bit higher fats than some people traditionally do. Yeah, you know, uh, that's that's going to be a really individualized thing. And I, I would say, uh, you know, I, this is a tough one to answer because you got, need to look at yeah. um, what is ideally from a time scale. You know, like you said, you need to make sure if, if I know somebody's cutting it close, I'm going to be more aggressive. Um, but if we have plenty of time, I can take my time with those cuts. But also, then this is where the tricky part comes in. You need to look at the mentality of the person. Are they mentally capable of handling this cut that is coming their way? Um, and, you know, as a coach, this is where I say the really big nuance uh, comes into play because you need to get a feel each week for how this person is doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's not always and, – and here's the thing too is you need to ask questions. I, I don't – this is another thing. I don't use a lot of spreadsheets, data spreadsheets – like a lot of other coaches do, I would say at least more scientific-minded coaches, because I want my clients to to speak to me. Um, yeah. I want them. I want them to write to me, um, because keep in mind, a lot of times your clients want to act tough. <laughs> they don't. They don't want to tell you when they're struggling. Even if you tell them, "Hey, tell me when you're struggling," a lot of them just aren't going to do it. Yeah. And so, um, I need to assess their mental state okay, I know we should cut 40 grams of carbohydrates this week, but is this person going to freak out if I cut 40 grams? Yeah, um, yeah. 
So um, during prep, I would say my range is uh, I may cut something between only as low as 10 carbohydrates all the way up to 40 carbohydrates, yeah. maybe with a few grams of fat. I don't make large slashes to fat in general. Um, I, I take it down, you know, three to five grams at a time probably. Yeah. Um, because also I've kind of found that um, slashes to fat seem to really uh, hurt people hunger more um, directly. And so if I cut too much fat at one time, I find that most people are going to struggle. Yeah. And so it's going to be a – fat is really um, – a gradual progression downward over the course of prep, whereas carbs may be higher or lower depending on the pace we are keeping. Okay. Uh, so that that would be the general method I use to cut, whereas fat's a slow progression and carbs are going to be gauged depending on the speed that we're seeing. Um, but you know, once again, individuality is going to play a big piece in this. Now I've talked about this before, but uh, for example, like um, African American clients. I will keep fats a little bit higher. They just they feel better. They perform better probably due to insulin resistance issues that are pretty mm -hmm. um, common in the black community. Like diabetes and insulin resistance are just way more common among black people than white people. So you know you need to keep that in mind. Like I I can get some of my black clients down to 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrates, but maybe fats in the well depending on the size of the person, 60 to 90 gram range. Yeah. And whereas myself. I would feel horrible, <laughs> you know. I, I would just feel like I was dying. Um, they report to me they feel maybe as good as they ever have, and uh, yeah. yeah. So you know, th this is where also the individuality comes in play. Um, and you can generally spot, not always, but you can generally spot some of them that has more insulin resistance, uh, probably in their genetics, uh, based on the way they look. You know, people that tend to struggle losing fat. Uh, people that maybe as a kid they were heavier, just you know they couldn't eat as much, you know things like that. So you can probably, or people that report, because for me as a you know somebody that loses fat rather easily, when I eat a lot of carbs, I feel really good the next day and the day of. But if somebody reports to you when they eat a lot of carbs, they just feel run down. Um, those are those are other signs that you can see that maybe this person will do a little, little bit better. System. Yeah, a little bit lower fat, little bit or a little bit higher fat, a little bit lower carbohydrates. So you use these clues to kind of eventually evolve people's diets into what you think they would need best. Um, so you know, over the course of prep, it starts to take shape. Yeah, one hundred percent. And it changes the, everything. Changes like that over the course of prep, and yeah, the carbs dial down a little bit. Fats either stay where they are, get a little lower. And as you mentioned, like you have your competitors that do much better, lower carbs, higher fats, and that's just extremely individualistic. As you mentioned, that one size does not fit all for this whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll talk maybe a little bit about uh, training now. Um, maybe we'll start off with cardio. Uh, I see a lot of people, you know, right out the gun, 45 minutes of cardio, like fasted cardio in the morning, or like, you know, a lot of hit and some just like a lot of lists. What do you do for cardio for clients and uh, why so? Uh, cardio is something I have changed drastically over the coach of, course of my <laughs> career. Uh, when I first started coaching, I was really a hit advocate uh, with the idea that less time spent doing cardio uh, would be a little bit easier for people's lives. Uh, also, the the idea that HIIT can build and or maintain muscle depending on the cal you know calories being taken in at the time. You know, the old sprinter versus marathon runner uh, yeah. analogy. You know, sprinters are more muscular, marathon runners are not. Um, but I have reversed that over the course of my career. A lot of people have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? The funny thing, and I don't want to like, I don't want to take credit and say, oh, you know, I've been doing this before it was popular. But I changed over, I changed over on that mindset probably four to four and a half years ago. Uh, and at the time, everyone's like, oh, you're such a bro. You have people doing low intensity cardio, and oh, uh, you know, um, you have them going for a walk on a treadmill or something like that. And I was accused of being a bro because of this. Yeah. But, um, it, here's the thing is that sprinters aren't dieting usually like crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. they, aren't, they aren't weight training. And uh, 
if you try to put somebody in a deep caloric deficit with low body fat levels, training five to six days per week intensely, they are going to be crushed by hit. They are 100%. Just, they are just going to feel terrible um, physically but also mentally because when you are just spent and you're at your limit and you're going to be looking down the barrel of you know, eight sprints, all-out sprints, you're just like, I can't even fathom doing this right now. And so I found it started to win. And so I slowly started graduating toward miss and lifts. And I use both of those now. And it's not to say I never use HIT, but it's probably more of a an off-season or beginning of diet type uh, mm -hmm. tool. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I I like miss and list because um, – and then here I'm going to say this. HIT I think is inappropriate for bodybuilders because it hurts your it hurts your muscle retention from a couple different standpoints. HIT's primary fuel is glucose uh, and so is weight training. So you are – effectively robbing your fuel for weight training so you will weight train less intensely because you have less of the fuel that is required and then also hit requires more recovery recovery that should be used for your weight training so you're robbing it on the front end and the back end Burn whereas, at both ends, yeah 100% yeah whereas lists body fat is the primary fuel now you have to spend more time doing it but it takes it takes no fuel from your weight training and it doesn't take any recovery to go for a walk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, totally. You, you go for a 30-minute walk. And I, uh, I kind of um, – I, 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 sometimes I don't like to use the word holistic because it makes you sound like you're into some sort of like voodoo hippie <laughs> stuff. Um, but it, I, I think it becomes almost like a holistic approach because um, I think it's good for men people mentally as well. Uh, a lot of times I'll tell – because I think people become consumed with this – uh, I've got to get up. I'm, you know, they they have this vision of Rocky. You know what I mean? Like Rocky yeah, doing totally. intense training. Um, people need to dial that back a little bit because it's too much uh, mentally and physically. It's it's emotionally and physically exhausting. I would rather tell somebody 30 minutes of lists. You know, uh, low intensity, steady state cardio. Why don't you go for a walk with your wife or your husband? Totally. You know what I mean? uh, stop being a bodybuilder for 30 minutes. You know what I mean? You can actually get your cardio in. Spend time with your significant other, um, and sort of use it as a de-stress moment while you're actually losing fat. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and that's even more powerful, you know. And that's something that I like to do. And at the beginning of the prep, I did it even more because it's starting to get pretty cold here, so I don't like to go outside anymore. <laughs> but besides yeah. that, like you know, it'd be like, what are you doing Sunday? Instead of being like, you know what, I'm going to go do this, I'd be like, let's go for a hike. Uh, let's go for a walk in the park and you know not only does that allow me to get outside that mind frame like you said for a bit stop being a bodybuilder and focusing I'm actually enjoying myself I'm spending time with family friends doing things outside that really don't require any recovery but it's still aiding in my goal and it's de-stressing so it's at the, that's a boatload of really good things you have going on that kind of take you out of that mindset and kind of make you happier in the same way you know release endorphins which is really important you know in general, just to be able to keep a more positive and uh, like mind towards it all, and you kind of look forward to these things after a while too, which I found myself doing. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and it's and, and, and like you said, stop being a bodybuilder for you know a, a small amount of time, and that's that's hard for people to hear. And I, I think probably my least, I, <laughs> I think I posted my least popular post ever a couple weeks back. Uh, I probably got more. Uh, disagreement with this post ever but I kind of uh, one thing I preach to my clients all the time is to stop being so excited all the time um, you know people get in this once again I I, I, I kind of call it the Rocky syndrome people have this like they have training montage videos like in their head you know thinking about Rocky training and living this lifestyle and you know they um, they've got to stop that I think it's I think it's good for people to learn to not get so up all the time uh, learn to just be a little more steady. If you avoid the highs, because a lot of these highs that people feel Chase are usually, lows. yeah, they're usually followed by a low. Uh, you know, I know what they do. They they sit in bed at night and they like envision themselves collecting that first place trophy on stage and how badass it'll be when they're hitting their posing routine and they're, they're probably laying in bed at night getting goosebumps from the adrenaline they feel. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they should be like sleeping. Yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, I even tell my clients, I'm like, stop even envisioning the show so much. Like, the show will come, you know, and it'll be fine. Um, Very quickly. It, it, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say avoid the highs and instead just focus on enjoying every little thing that you do. You know what I mean? Enjoy the moments. Enjoy, enjoy your training. Enjoy this meal. Enjoy the walk with your wife or your girlfriend or maybe sit on the bike and read a book or something like that. You know what I mean? Enjoy each moment rather than always feeling like you need to get yourself up and excited. And people hated hearing that, by the way. They absolutely right. like – they despised hearing that. But, um, you know, it's, it's much easier – to psych yourself up into this frenzy, which usually has uh, a downside on the back end, like we said, it's usually followed by a low. It's much easier to accept that than to just say, just enjoy your life while you do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. And you know what? It's it's really interesting that we have like this uh, like ongoing theme right now that we've been talking that it's important to stay centered with all of this stuff. And this is something that's come up numerous times, even since we started with our first question. You know, that it's important to stay centered throughout all of this. And not get too extreme in the low or too extreme in the high because, you know, that kind of has adverse effects over time. And I, I think that's very, very, very true that, you know, it's the, the balance of the everything is very, very important, especially to athletes in prep, you know, to juggle lifestyle, friends, family, all these other things that become affected because they do to a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, it's really, really good, <laughs> I think, to be able to stay centered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think once again, it's not telling people not to enjoy the process, but to enjoy it differently. Yeah, uh, you know, enjoy the moments rather than constantly looking ahead and trying to get yourself all excited. And I, I get it; excitement feels good, and it's not saying never do that, but just focus on reeling it in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Now uh, we've gone through this through uh, cardio. How do you uh, deal with periodization in? Uh, Prep, and I'll ask a couple of questions at the same time right now. Actually, um, with dealing with periodization, uh, do you deload your clients, and also do you overreach them at like the end of a mesocycle during training? Okay, so much along the lines with cardio, this is something that I have adjusted over my career, and this is where I'm probably also once again going to be accused of being a bro. Uh, I don't periodize in the traditional man manner of mesocycles and uh, microcycles and things like that because yeah, yeah. Um, now for powerlifting I think that's effective because you are training with a certain rep range and creating that adaptation and you need to be careful because you can't always lift in the heaviest rep ranges totally. uh, and so or else you're just going to be injured all the time so you need to build towards that specificity of your meat um, but for bodybuilding purposes I don't necessarily think that training for – because the adaptations we see occurring with, with training usually take place over the 24 to 48 hours after training. So I don't think that we are necessarily doing ourselves a favor by trying to create adaptations months in advance. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, I don't usually periodize in terms of – uh, you know, months in advance, I think a lot of that is more mental. I think mm -hmm. a lot of times, yeah, people will go through a period of lifting heavy, but I think it's not necessarily what they need physically. It's what they need mentally because yeah. that, that change of pace keeps them mentally engaged in the process. Do you see what I mean? So a lot of times, I don't, I'm not saying I won't go through periods of lower rep training or higher rep training or even a little bit lower volume or a little bit higher volume. But I base that more on the feedback that I'm getting from the person. Okay. Um, you know, are they becoming a little bit stale with what they're doing? Do they do they feel like they're getting that itch to train heavier? Do you know what I mean? Um, so with that, uh, I generally will use a sort of auto regulation approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to, t not often. Now I will build in some sort of. Uh, progression, you know, we should try to add weight on these lifts, you know what I mean? Because once again, I think that becomes more mentally engaging for people. But also with a lot of the programs that, that I give, I don't give people RPE scales or anything yeah. like that because I want to, them to learn to auto-regulate because I think um, with RPE scales and things like that, it ignores life. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think 
I think, you know, sometimes people will go into a workout with maybe an RPE 7. For those that don't know, RPE scales is rates of perceived exertion. So, like, something like a 7 would maybe even be a little bit lower on the RPE scale. They wouldn't push themselves quite as hard. So, I wouldn't want to give somebody – maybe I maybe I prescribe somebody to work mostly with an RPE 7 for that day, but maybe they just feel good. You know, they slept a lot last night. They woke up, and they just had one of those days. You know what I mean? They're just feeling on top of the world. Um I don't want them to stick to an RPE 7 that day. Let's go for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I want them to take advantage of this day where they feel so amazing. Um, then on the you know on the opposing end, what if I am prescribing somebody a day where they really should go for it, and uh, maybe they, they slept terribly last night, or you know maybe you know uh, life happens. Maybe they got into an argument with their husband yesterday, and you know they're stressed out, or you know stuff at work, and they just, you know, they don't have it in them to break a record today. Um, and so I, I tell my clients with the training programs I give them, it is a guide, but not a hard rule. Um, I will prescribe sets and reps, but they have the ultimate say to call an audible in that moment. Um, they can, I prescribe even a certain number of sets and reps, but they can add a few more sets for that day if they're just feeling great. Now, they need to exercise responsibility, much like with their diet. Mm -hmm. um, I give them this freedom, but you shouldn't add 10 sets for the day, you know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, one or two here or there um, yeah. is, is appropriate. And then also, likewise, on the days when they're just feeling down, you know, things haven't been going as well, same thing, reduce one or two. Um, but generally, uh, I kind of like to auto-regulate with how they're feeling and then take advantage of what they are feeling in that moment. And then inevitably, we all hit that point where you feel like you have overreached. Um, and when that point comes, I will either deload or even a preferable, what I prefer is time off. Um, I think I think time off tends to be a little bit more effective because one, uh, I think it is good to, some of the research shows that just completely stepping away from the stimulus of training can even make future training more effective. Um, but also I think it uh, just sort of acts as a reset um, towards everything. You know, you just feel fresh, and I think it allows them to get out of the gym a little bit and focus on other things. And I think sometimes, too, bodybuilders uh, train so much and so often, sometimes they let other things in life kind of pile up. And I think, you know, taking three to five days off or something like that will let them – catch up on some of those things and recalibrate their brain a little bit. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I know that that all sounds uh, a little vague, but, um, like I said, I, I try to build in, I try to build in constructs, but then they're not so strict that I ignore their individuality and situation in the context of it. So there are some constructs in place, but they have the freedom to move around within those constructs. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And, you know, for, for myself, for deloads, I do a six-day split. It's very, like, push-pull legs, push-pull legs sort of thing. And, you know, for when I deload, and I find this works best for me, and, you know, I could split it up so I could do uh, six days at, like, very, very small amounts of volume, or I could do three. I like to prefer to take those three days right in a row, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I have, like, two or three days off at the beginning of the week. Then I do my deload in the middle it's still enough like in there that I feel like I'm doing something because yeah. I find if I split the volume up way too much over a period of six days, I'm kind of like, am I even like, I lose motivation to be in there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and then I have a couple of days off at the end of the week and the next week I just feel amazing and I'm able to get in and crush it all over again. And I find one of those things, again, it's individuality. Like I know people that would probably rather be in there for more days just to be in there to say, okay, I went there. It's a mental game. I got in, did my cardio, did my thing, and got it. But yeah, I find that that style works personally for me. Yeah, and, and I do think that training is one of those things where, because I, I think for a lot of people, I mean, all of us, let's be real, we we use this as a version of therapy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. Uh, I, I think that that's also another thing that needs to be taken in consideration, is um, because. You know, some people are more capable of pushing themselves with intensity. Some people are capable of pushing themselves more in terms of volume. And so I think that that's where the individuality, and that's where I also find I, I encourage my clients to not just go in there because well, if I give somebody a very strict, very strict 
program. Um, I feel like it almost fosters their um, their likelihood of going in there and turning their brain off. And I don't want that. I want them to learn to read. Read themselves. Read, yeah, read themselves, read their body, read the feedback that their body is giving them. How do you? How does this make you feel? How does that make you feel? You know, do you? How do you feel the next day after doing this or that? And so, um, you know, I, I just think that as you look around in the sport, uh, I, I think we'd all agree that some of the top people in the sport are not necessarily the most scientifically inclined. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> but I will say this: usually, they are some of the people that really are in tune with what their body's telling them. And so I think if you can take the scientifically uh, the, the scientific information that we have available and then combine it with that ability to read your own body, then you've got something special going on there. I, yeah, I agree 100%. It's pretty cool. You, you see and hear a lot about this now more and more. Like as I browse through different people's like podcasts and other things, like this is something that's coming up, you know, that's mental aspect of it and reading your body is extremely important. And I know we talked about just a minute ago, you know, the receive uh, rate of exertion and things like that. Last week I didn't sleep very well. I got like five hours sleep. I just worked late that night. I had to get up early in the morning for a commitment and I was tanked and I actually had to basically like take that day and drop my weight a lot just to equate the volume just to get the work in and you know the intensity was not there the volume was but just with a much lower intensity but the next day I felt amazing just because I toned it down a little bit you know and well, that's super important to be able to do that yeah and there's nothing wrong with that and I'll nope. say this because I, I travel a lot uh, for work you know I do speaking engagements or I go to shows and uh, in the early part of my coaching career, I would like uh, I'd go to a show day, for example, and in between shows, I'd be like, I'm gonna train some legs today, and I'd I'd have these like high hopes, like, cause you know I'd be fired up from the show too, you know I'd watch the show, and then I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna train legs today, and I was maybe supposed to train heavy legs, and I would try to just like, you know, bull through it, and of course it was a terrible workout because I woke up early that day to be with clients. I didn't sleep. I was stressed from, you know, clients stepping on stage. Um, so I would try to push through. My workout was not good. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, then you know, I'd have travel too on the way back, and I would try to get my training session in, and I would be so exhausted when I got home. It would take me a few days to recover. So now when I travel, I don't even try to work out on on show days anymore because it's just utterly pointless. So I take that extra day off, um, but while I'm traveling, I may stop and I'll maybe lighten the weight up a little bit. Like you said, yeah. reduce the reduce the intensity. Uh, you know, it feels a, a lot more comfortable, and I, I feel like I get a lot more done if I instead of trying to do a four to six rep range, instead of maybe a fifteen to twenty rep range. Um, I can actually stimulate something and get a lot of volume in, but it'll be a little bit less mentally and physically taxing. And then when I go home, I don't need two or three days to recover. I'm ready to go back into killing it again. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't an idiot and tried to just push through it and show everyone how badass I am. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. You know what? I, I hear you. And it's it's once again that in, intelligence of being a little intuitive. That you know you're still getting in there. You're still getting the work done. And it actually puts you in a better position later because you're able to do that workout that you may have wanted to do that day. Maybe you can do that a couple of days later. And yes. th then you're in a more optimal position to recover because recovery is, as we all know, just as important as getting in and training and doing it so that you can actually like overload yourself, right? So it's a. Uh... Yeah, you know, and, and learning to be a little bit flexible with your training is not a bad thing. Uh, and, and you know something I, I put together a while ago, uh, a strange correlation, as I found people that were really into flexible dieting, uh, you know, they're really big into you know working in some ice cream or whatever it is into your diet. They love flexible dieting. Those tend to be the people that are the most rigid with their training. They are really like, this is what RPE I'm supposed to train with today, and this is my you know volume load for the week, and this is my deload, and they like will not change. And then meanwhile, people that are like overly flexible with their training, you know, intuitive trainers, uh, then those are the people that are 
like grossly inflexible with their diet, like the really clean <laughs> eaters. And I'm like, what, you know, why can't we just find a middle ground? Like, realize it's good to have some flexibility on both ends. <laughs> I, I, I've read you post that somewhere before, or like seen that in an interview, and I, it's like, I actually was like, wow, that's really true because I find that as well. <laughs> that's, and in fact, I'm kind of that person that gets like a little inflexible with their diet. And I actually made myself think, I was like, man, you need to like chill out on the whole, like <laughs> make sure like you get that exact gram with your baked potato, bro. <laughs> it's like nail it. Oh, it's... <laughs> I, I, it makes me wonder because generally people's nature is sort of tra travel across, uh, you know, different areas. So it makes me wonder why that is, why people's uh, nature sort of flips on those on those uh, two parts, but I don't know. It's very interesting to me. Yeah, I, I find it very curious as well. Um, we just have a couple more things to talk about. How are you doing for time? You good? I'm good. I'm okay. I'm good. Perfect. All right. Well, get into the uh, infamous peak week. I know a lot of people want to talk to you about this, and you know, um, coming from a background here, that you know, one size doesn't fit all for peak week, and I want to point that out to my viewers before we even talk about this that. One size doesn't fit all here. This isn't like a cookie cutter sort of thing. Uh, something is different for everybody. And, you know, going into comp season right now, I know a lot of people are comping for the first time. Some of you don't have coaches. This isn't something you just want to take up your last week and be like, I seen Cliff. He told me to do this on Henry's podcast because I am not taking on that responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think he uh, should either. So no. this is something that everyone should practice like way, way before your show. This is something that you should have already, if you have coaches, discuss with them and like go into something and practice because this has a very, very high probability of ruining your physique more than <laughs> making it better. It really does. And you know, if you're not ready, this is a really big thing I want to point out to all my viewers as well. Peak week is done by people that deserve the peak week. If you do a peak week without being ready, it has even more so a chance of hindering you more than like doing better. And I just wanted to point that out right now before we go a, any further. That is a beautiful disclaimer. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, uh, and I'm going to turn on a light here so you guys can still see me. So it is a beautiful thing because um, I think a lot of people misunderstand the purpose of Peak Week or what Peak Week should be. Um, and you are absolutely right. If you are, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of science and physiology behind everything that we do as bodybuilders but peak week very much so and I'll say that the more unsure you are of what you are doing the more uh, subtlety will be your friend um, and you know sometimes for people that have followed me know that I have kind of um, pushed forward some more drastic methods <laughs> with, with peak yeah. week um, but I think that with some of these are methods that I am very sound on in terms of the science behind it, as well as the just actual practice of it. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I should say before I say anything, you need to practice and or study and both before you start carrying out some of the more drastic methods. So I, I guess I, I think we should say, state that <laughs> before we get Yeah, no, no, 100%. And, you know, with, with, yeah, this is something that even, like, every coach, a lot of them stick to certain styles. I know, like, you know, 3DMJ will probably do something that, different than you do. And, like, every coach kind of has their own kind of thing they stick with and that they're comfortable with and they can see telltale signs as people are peaking throughout the week and they know how to react to them as well, right? So it's, yes. yeah, very, very important to get that out there as well. But Absolutely. go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, no, so I was just saying with peak week, I think you need to understand there is there is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, there are many different ways, but different ways will also produce different results, different types of looks. And so, uh, you know, I think the first thing you need to look at is what division you are doing. The best approach for, for a peak for a bikini competitor is not the best approach for a peak for a bodybuilder. Um, they have two different ideal looks, and so the approach should be different. Uh, so, you know, I'll even start with something like bikini, where a subtle look is best. You don't want too hard or too tight. So you're probably going to want something that's more subtle. I don't, uh, I, I, for myself, I will typically do something along the lines of a front load or what I call a mid load. So I'll, 
I'll load carbohydrates at the beginning of the week on a front load, and then I just taper down into the show. Or a mid load where I build them up to the middle point of the week, and then no I will slowly bring them down just ever so slightly. Because these will produce more subtle looks in my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I guess it would depend for you how deep do you want me to go into things like sodium and water and uh, play well, into it. We can just start, like – <laughs> I, I know this is kind of like a rabbit hole and like I could actually just like talk about this for a very long period of time but I would basically like to talk about uh, water um, you know okay. as well as sodium we don't have to get into something as like in intricate as like the sodium potassium pump and things like that <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, I guess so, I, I'll give basics I'll give basics here so I'll say this uh, I think the thing that people need to understand is that um, sodium water carbohydrates, they all work in connection with each other. Uh, when you carb up, you know, everyone's familiar with carving up, but I think a lot of people still cut water. <laughs> which, they, yeah, uh, salt as I, well. There's a lot of salt people yeah. cutting, like, salt as well. So it's, and, uh, and, and so, you know, when you eat carbohydrates, they store within the muscle tissue as glycogen, but they store with water. And most of the fullness that you see from carving up is the result of that water being stored with the glycogen. And then, so, so your carb up is ineffective without water. And then there's another issue of sodium actually is a co-transport with glucose uh, into the cells. So you need sodium to make your carb up more effective. Now, there are other ways for the glucose to get into the cells, but it's going to be much more effective if sodium is present. Um, <clears throat> and then... So as you mentioned, potassium, you do want some potassium in there. I won't go too deeply into the yeah. you know, machinery of the cells, but just know that uh, sodium and potassium work in combination with each other to regulate intracellular and extracellular water. So you know, I think I, I don't like the term holding water um, because you know some people say, oh, I felt like I was holding water on show day. Um, for the most part, uh, you were probably too fat. <laughs> that you, um, it's it's yeah. really funny because last yeah. year I got back my review and the review said it looked like you were holding water in your back and I was like, nope, I was too fat. <laughs> yeah, and and given that we are composed primarily of water, I sure hope everyone is holding water or else <laughs> you will die. Um, yeah, right. So uh, no, so okay, I think the the biggest thing is don't fear drinking water because more of you we in our bodies we all have uh. In, Intracellular stored in the cellular compartments, and we have extracellular water that is stored extracellularly uh, outside of the cells. Obviously, we want intracellular water because that's going to create more fullness and a better pump and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we also have water that's stored in blood, plasma. Uh, so, you know, when we cut water, so we have more of our water stored intracellularly than we do extracellularly. So the ratio already works in our favor. And when you reduce your water intake or you just cut it all together, you are just going to see total body water levels reduce, uh, which is not a good thing because that ratio is working in your favor. So you see drop of intracellular water, you see extracellular water drop, but you also see you know uh, a reduction of blood volume from that and sodium as well. So it makes yeah. it harder to get a pump. Uh, so essentially you kind of become softer because then your muscle tissue isn't pushing out as tightly against your skin. You know, think of a think of a balloon that's been filled with water. It pushes real tightly against it. It's taut. Um, it's kind of the same effect with somebody who has enough water coming in. Um, but, you know, if you def if you empty out all the water, the, it's kind of saggy and soft. And you kind of see that effect. And, and it, like you said, it's something that you pick up over time. But I can sit at a bodybuilding show and I can literally pick out the competitors that cut their water. Yeah. Um, I look for the people that have this, um, even if they're very lean, they sort of have this softness to them, mm -hmm. this uh, almost a saggy look to them. Uh, I can spot it just because I've seen it so many times over the years and it's very visible. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's not a real powerful look on stage. And then, uh, you know, a, a another good analogy too for another reason not to fear water is that. Uh, <clears throat> Think of your body like a bathtub with the drain open. Uh, if you turn the water on, the excess will just run out. You know, the drain is open. You will keep, if you keep drinking water, you will continue to urinate. It's just going to yeah. keep coming out. Uh, 
Now, water follows, follows solutes. You know, like we said, water uh, you know, will follow those carbohydrates into the muscle cells. So imagine I start, that drain is still open, that water is still on. Imagine I start throwing sponges into the bathtub. Uh, that the water will stick to those sponges, the carbohydrates, which is a good thing because it creates the fullness. So uh, if I start continue to throw sponges into the bathtub and eventually get to the point where the sponges are over the top of the brim of the bathtub, uh, the water will start to spill over the edge of the bathtub okay. uh, because I have overfilled the bathtub with sponges. There's too many. The water has nowhere to go. It's spilling out. And you can think of your body the exact same way. If you overcarb, the carbohydrates will have nowhere to go but outside of the cells, outside of the muscle tissue. The glucose will flow around in that interstitial space, and it will draw water to it. So that is how spill happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to peak properly, you need to aim with the goal of the appropriate amount of sodium, which can really vary from person to person, but you know, if you're not sure, stick with something that's around what you've been taking in. Um, you want to keep water coming in at a high rate and then make sure that you appropriately carb up. Not too much because you'll spill or not under because you won't be full like you should be. So mm -hmm. that would be my, my most direct synopsis of how peak week should run. <laughs> it, it's really interesting because I, I remember an interview you did like a year or so ago. Uh, you, you even said like for bikini athletes, if you want to soften them up, you actually cut their water a little bit. <laughs> yes, yeah. I've had a few times where I thought a couple of my bikini competitors were too lean and I will actually – cut their water to make them look softer. Uh, exactly, you know, yeah. and, and meanwhile, uh, you see bodybuilders just cutting their water thinking they're going to get all, get shredded, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, yeah, yeah it, it will make you look flatter. So, um, you know, the key in a good peak week really lies in carbohydrates, um, hitting the correct amount of carbohydrates. If you keep your, if you keep water consistently high, sodium, you know, consistently moderately high, and you just play around with carbohydrates, you can get a pretty good peak out of that. Um, now, I will say, you know, once again, there are some things that I do that I maybe don't recommend a lot of people do, like a rapid backload peak where I really try to take advantage of some super compensation and things like that. Um, but for the average person getting ready for a bodybuilding show, you don't need to do anything too crazy. Yeah, I agree 100%. You know, it's the, the average person doesn't need to do anything too crazy. And, uh, the rapid backload is actually one of the most cool things I read about, and I, I don't. There's not enough information on the internet, like direct science information on it, and it's it's kind of a shame because I've read a couple of um, you know you've done like interviews through articles and stuff through yeah. different places and stuff, and like uh, this is what choke, uh, caused me to delve a lot into the whole like potassium, sodium, carbohydrate, water ratios, and how it all works uh, intracellularly, extracellularly, and how it works together, and it's it's actually quite amazing, and if anybody wants to do some really cool reading it's uh it's got some cool stuff to actually back it up and it's yeah you know, you know in the rapid backload some of the the ideas for those that don't know the rapid backload is a peak week that i use for my bodybuilders where uh i will deplete carbohydrates but then the day before the show i'll maybe give them anywhere from 800 to 1400 grams of carbohydrates <laughs> in a single day uh going into the show and it creates a lot of fullness and i'll say this like when i first started coaching um not only did people not like it, it pissed them off. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why it created such hostility, um, and I still get that. But I mean, I was doing it, and I still do it. Um, but you know, the the um, the scientific ideas behind it, uh, it's grounded in proven science, but also I have some theories, you know, some hypothesis about what is taking place um, in order to create. A situation where you can take in that many carbs uh, mm -hmm. without spilling, um, you know. So there's some some absolutely proven concepts there, and there's some that are just ideas that I have, um, and you know, it, it clicks when I put it into practice. Um, I, I do, a, and I find it kind of funny because I do a lot of speaking engagements, and I, um, a lot of times people are like, because I do have a talk where I talk about the rapid backload, and I have sometimes people. They're like, I'm like, what do you want to hear me talk about when I come? And they're always like, peaking, rapid backload. <laughs> but but the funny thing is, like, when I actually do the talk, it is it is very science heavy, 
and I don't think I people, <laughs> I don't, but I don't think the most bodybuilders they yeah. think they want to know about it. But when I do that talk, I tend to see eyes kind of start to glaze over a little bit <laughs> um, because, like, I'm you know I'm bringing out charts of cellular models and I'm like really talking about and I'm trying to like I try to like break it up with some humor, but there's only so much I can do. And so right. I, a lot of times I tell people I'm like, are you sh- are you sure you want me to talk about this? Because yeah. uh, you know it's pretty science heavy, but no, I, I find yeah. that pretty funny because everybody thinks that's what they want to hear about. But I would say I would say generally when I do that talk, there's like two or three people in the audience that are like, yeah, this is great, and then there's like. You know, maybe like 30 people that are like, oh, God, this is a lot of information. <laughs> right? No, it's, it's uh, I do this at uh, certain topics with my clients, and they'll be talking to me, and they'll ask me a question, and then, like, I'll just go off, and I'll just, like, start talking and talking, and then all of a sudden, I'm, like, explaining some really data-heavy stuff to them, and I'll just look up after two minutes, and they're like... <laughs> What and I'm like, yeah. I forget. Sometimes you forget who you're talking to in your audience and things like that. But it's just, it's just really funny because that stuff. I get very excited about it, and once I start a tangent, it's just there's no stopping me. Yeah, so I, I, no. I would I would I would love to see one of those <laughs> talks. I'd be there with a, with a notebook, basically like drawing diagrams. Yeah, it's too funny. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, we covered pretty much anything, and I wanted to talk about the mindset of a successful bodybuilder, and a lot of the things that I actually had questions about, we already covered in <laughs> a lot of this talk, just through talking about certain things, um, but, you know, we talked about people complaining about their diets and things, and, uh, you know, the ability to stay centered during a prep, and, you know, to the powerfulness of you know having the ability to spend time with family and friends not going off the rails not getting too excited and following that with lows you know and I mentioned before we got on air something you talked about before was with these sort of things with making gains or losses you need to have a sense of patience and uh, follow it with you know you need to have urgency and do you remember what you were talking about when you talked about that yeah you know I, I with, with patience and urgency, it's something I preach. And, and the reason I talk about mindset so much, um, because for myself as a coach and you know even as a competitor, I can give somebody the best plan in the world, but if I don't give them the mental tools, because let me put it this way, the best plan in the world for a competitor is not an easy one. <laughs> uh, it's not easy. And if I don't give them the mental tools, they won't be able to carry out that plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in my mind, as a coach and as a competitor, you need to not always. It, there's a big push right now in terms of the industry of creating a sustainable plan, um, and and there's truth to that. Your plan needs to be sustainable, but oftentimes I don't want my plan to become easier to make it more sustainable. I want my clients to become stronger to sustain the plan. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That makes uh, total sense. And uh, you know, and I think a lot of coaches or competitors compromise on their plan because at the moment they are not mentally strong enough to carry it out, uh, rather than making the effort to become mentally stronger to carry it out. And so you know, it's this, it's this. There's always this. Um, there's always a dichotomy, uh, a strange contrast in the mental approach we need to take. Like you said, you need to treat every day, every minute with a sense of urgency. I need to get this workout in and perform well. I need to eat this meal and hit my macros. I need to hit my macros for the day. I need to get this good night of sleep. But you also need to realize I am willing to wait years before I start to see physical differences in my body due to the sense of urgency, which is so yeah. hard. It's really easy, I would say, particularly in the off-season, for people to let that sense of urgency fade. Um, oh, you know, I'm going to go out and enjoy myself this weekend, and, you know, it turns into two days of a free-for-all of eating. Um, oh, you know, I have plenty of time until my next show. I'm not going to go to the gym today. And, uh, you know, that sense of urgency really fades on them. When in the off season, I think that's a time when you almost need that sense of urgency more than ever, mm-hmm. uh, and you know that's when you also need to be patient for the results because you're not going to be seeing that fat loss change every day. So you need to learn to embrace both of those um, opposing, you know, uh, ideas 
the urgency and the patience. And uh, and then I would even say, you know, with uh, with a lot of things that you do, uh, you need to have because I think also a lot of people enter the sport because they're unhappy with themselves or unhappy with their body or the way they look, um, and they want to improve it. But I don't think that's necessarily a spot that's going to lead to long-term success because generally if you dislike yourself, it's just not a good spot to be in and it's going to lead to a lot of highs and lows. So then I think, once again, you need to have this strange contrast of I need to appreciate the way I look and how far I've come, you know what I mean? Look back at where you were and say I'm proud of what I've done and I've, you know, I've gotten this far. But at the same time, you need to be like, hungry to keep going for more you know you are never content with where you're at so it's it's always this balance of you are pulling from one end or one feeling one mentality but also Mm -hmm. embracing the other end and you know you always need to find that balance of it and so um you know it's it's hard (laughs) it is it is it is it is very hard in fact you know it was said to me a while ago you know the first day you start bodybuilding is the last day you'll ever be satisfied with how you look (laughs) And it's really interesting that I actually like thought about that for quite a while. And I was like, you know, I am very happy with where I am now. And like to the average person that doesn't compete, you know, they'll say, holy shit, man, like you have veins in your abs, like you're shredded. But like I'll pinch the inside of my abs and I'm like, yeah, there's still granules there. I still have time. I got to go. Like there's, it's, I still have more, but I'm completely comfortable with where I am, but I'm like where I'm progressing. But I know like I'm looking at this time frame. I'm 34 years old and I'm like, holy shit, I got only got a couple more years of really nailing this out, like in trying to get nationals, like for men's physique, you know, like as I get older, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years. And I like, I know I need to have a two year off season next year to put in some serious growth before I even attempt to do a national stage. Goes and that's fast. putting me, you know, and that's, that it does, it goes very fast. And this is my third show. And, you know, I, I know where I need to be. And people would look at me right now and say, oh, great, like you can go up and you could do nationals and you'd do well or whatever or do this. And I'm like, no, no, I, I know what the goal is here and I know how far I have to go. But it's it's really interesting that you can see the mentality of that, you know, that you're satisfied, but you're never really satisfied. And you've got to have that hunger and you've got to have it all year too, right? Like, Yeah, and, and I guess the last thing that I would say in terms of ment- mentality is I'm really big on – life perspective um, because I think I think once you have perspective there's a strength that comes with that uh, because I think we've all been there in prep where you are just starving and you are exhausted and everything in your brain is screaming at you to eat <laughs> you know uh, and it can almost feel like a panicked feeling urgent you know what I mean you mm-hmm. need to eat uh, I think perspective can give you the ability to Take a minute and say, "This is a temporary feeling." Um, mm. While your while your biology is telling you you are starving to death, uh, because it feels urgent. Because throughout human history, that feeling indicates that you are starving to death. You need food. You have to eat now. But we know this is not a life or death situation. You know what I mean? It's uh, uh, we can take that perspective. This is not a life or death situation. I have another meal coming in two hours. I do not need to gorge myself. This is a temporary feeling until the next time I eat, and then mm-hmm. I go through it. And so the ability to slow yourself down, switch your perspective, realize that we are we're just fine. Nothing bad is going to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, by not cheating on your diet, um, you know th- that that perspective is really powerful. And but you need to be able to take a minute switch that perspective in those moments where you really need it and remind yourself that this is something you're choosing to do. It's not that bad. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. Yeah. And you know what? It's uh, for me, what I find very, very interesting is uh, outside of, you know, the physique based industry. I very, very much like to follow a lot of stuff like uh, life coaching and like uh, the most successful people in business in the world, as well as like, you know, people who do marketing and stuff. In fact, I'm reading some stuff right now on Simon Sinek. And it's just basically about that sort of stuff, like finding that mindset and making it like taking it and changing your state 
And in fact, I, it's like Tony Robbins is someone that writes about this a lot. And he's like, you can take someone's mind state from very sad and just like change the way you act for two minutes, like smile, go about your day. And within like, unless you start thinking about your hunger again, you'll realize a half hour to an hour later, it's like, wow, like that passed very quickly. And like you said, like, you know, you're not starving to death. You know, you're not going to die. But as long as you're able to change your focus away from something, like change what you're thinking about or like start up a task. And by the time you look up next, it's like, oh, wow, I, I got to eat again in a half hour. I'm completely fine. And then you look at it and go, oh, I only got a half hour left. Like, that's nothing. Right. And it's uh, changing yeah. your state is a very, very powerful thing to be able to do when dining or for anything of those facts, you know. Well, and, and you said it perfectly, changing your uh, your state because you know bodybuilders and I've made I made YouTube videos about this too. Bodybuilders really get in this mode of feeling sorry for themselves. Oh, I'm hungry again today. I've got to do cardio. I feel bad. Uh, you know, and it just becomes this this real downer type thing. And uh, every day is just this drag. And uh, you know, I think the ability to kind of wake up and say no, uh, I live in a a world where I live in I live in a country. Where I have so many resources, I get to do this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, I'm I have my health. I'm healthy enough where I get to push myself physically, uh, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of other people are not so lucky. No. So um, I think kind of I guess I would say waking up each day and instead of saying I have to do this, um, start You're realizing lucky to be able to do so. Yeah. So start, instead of I have to do this, why don't you start realizing you get to do this? <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a big difference right there. It is. And like for me, you know, I'm one of those people. I don't like doing low intensity or steady state <laughs> cardio. It drives me crazy. And it's mostly because I get very bored. So I used to have a really negative thought towards doing cardio when I had to. So what I did was, what do I like doing? Okay, well, I have time now that I have to do 40 minutes of like walking on an incline. I take out my notepad, I take out my like um, phone, I'll watch a podcast, I'll watch a YouTube video, I'll read like some right like the mass papers or something that come out for that month and I'll like start taking notes and all of a sudden 40 minutes later I'm done and I have all these notes taken and I've learned all these new things, you know, and all of a sudden this is something that I look forward to now. I look yep. forward to cardio because I changed it from shit I have to do cardio again to Oh, awesome. I got time now. I get to go study for 40 minutes and like while I'm doing this and this is something that I get to enjoy while I'm doing it. So it's kind of like, you know, just change up how you view things. And like you said just then, you're lucky to be able to do this. We live in a world that I can, if I'm really hungry and I say, you know what, hell with it, I can go eat food. But there's a lot of people in the world that aren't that blessed. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think we also live in a time because I think social media plays into this. It's not like it's social media changes the nature of people, but I think it just, um, enhances, I guess I would say, because uh, I think we live in a time where people like to see themselves as the victim. Um, yeah. Because they they enjoy the attention it gives them, and you know people give them attention for, I guess the word I would use is pity. Um, you know, oh, I can't believe you go through this, poor you. But um, you know that really becomes a defeatist attitude, and I mm -hmm. think that uh, I think sometimes kind of switching that mentality, you realize. You know, no, nothing about what you have to go through in the sport makes you a victim. <laughs> nothing. No. Not at all. Because no. you're choosing it. And so, uh, you know, there are people that are real victims out there of circumstance or whatever it may be. But nothing in this sport makes you a victim. Uh, nobody should feel sorry for you because you're hungry. Because you're doing it to yourself. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know... Uh, Kind of switch up that mindset uh, to once again, I'm, I'm not the victim in this situation at all. Yeah, and like uh, seeking attention through pity is a rabbit hole that people shouldn't go down in the first place. You know, yeah. it's, and, a, and, it's, and it's I, an unhealthy trait, and like that's something that, you know, after you do that for a while, and that's how you figure out how to get attention, and that's how you portray yourself on social media. That's a, like I said, it's a rabbit hole that you just don't want to go down in the first place. You want to have an optimistic and positive mindset and portray that instead of trying to seek attention through negative thoughts like that, right? It's a, Absolutely. It. And, yeah. and so, you know, I guess I guess I would say, you know, with the whole mindset thing is, uh, the best way I can sum it up is um, find ways to empower yourself mentally, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And you know what? I think that's probably the perfect spot to end this interview on because we went a lot longer than I had anticipated. <laughs> but I, I, I told absolutely... you. 
I yeah, told you yeah, I'll, I'll talk too much. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. In fact, I think my viewers will absolutely love this. And, you know, I had nothing else planned to do this evening. And I really, really, really enjoyed our chat. We talked about a lot of stuff and I covered everything I wanted to do. So, Cliff, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time out of the day. I know you're incredibly busy, especially this time of year, for you to take an hour and 40 minutes to come here and talk with me and my viewers. Uh, it was extremely special. And, uh, I, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I had a blast, man. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hopefully we'll talk again in the future, Cliff. Have a uh, great rest of your season, and uh, cheers. Thanks.